I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. Families are the very core of society, and stable families form stable communities that create a healthy and stable nation. There's a growing concern about the number and, uh, and effects of fatherless homes in America, yet the issue doesn't appear to receive much media or public attention. With joining me in a conversation on the issues and concerns of fatherless homes is Dr. Bradford Wilcox. He's a professor of sociology at the University of Virginia and director of the National Marriage Project. And thank you so much for joining the conversation. I'm Bob, it's good to be here with you today. Well, before we get into some of the issues uh, uh, related to fatherless homes, uh, would you uh, share with us a little bit about the National Marriage Project? So the National Marriage Project is dedicated to looking at major trends in marriage and family life in America, to figuring out how family and marriage matter for the welfare of kids, and to articulating uh, public and cultural strategies that can be helpful in strengthening a marriage, uh, American family life. Well, um, do you, from your perspective, would you say that there is an epidemic or a crisis of fatherless uh, households? Yeah, Bob, I think what we've seen since the 1960s is that the share of kids who are being raised apart from their fathers has more than doubled from about 20% to almost 50%, you know, in this day and age. And because dads play a crucial role in the lives of their kids, you know, on average, uh, that does amount to a crisis for, you know, for many kids across this country. And yet, why news, Why does it seem that it doesn't receive the media attention or it seems a little bit controversial perhaps to discuss the issue? Well, you know, I think part of the issue here is that, you know, journalists, politicians, professors, um, you know, many of them have, you know, had difficulties in their own marriages and families or they have, you know, friends or family members who have. So there's probably kind of a personal challenge. How do you kind of address something that often touches on your own life or that of, you know, of, of loved ones in one way or another. I think it's also the case too that um, there's a kind of progressive idea that families are, are changing, you know, they're not in any way kind of losing ground. And so this kind of progressive idea basically wants us to sort of look at every change that sort of kind of rolled across the American family landscape in the last half century as a good one. Um, and so that kind of progressive um, idea makes it hard for folks to, to address this head on. And then I think finally, you know, there's, there is a, a kind of a dominant narrative out there about kind of the idea that it's really structure that matters for our kids and families. So it's things like economics, it's things like race that are the really important drivers of American family life. And I'm not in any way minimizing the importance of those larger structural realities. We have to also understand that one other structure here is pretty important. And that is, you know, family structure. And so that's what we're talking about here today, Bob. Well, you know, one thing in preparing for our conversation that shocked me, that 43% of fathers don't consider their role to be significant in a child's life. I don't know, that just seemed somewhat counterintuitive, but to think that fathers, that number, 43%, don't think that they really have a role in terms of the, of the child's lives like that. That was a, a, an alarming statistic I found. Yeah, well, I, mean, I think in terms of the broader culture at large, I, mean, I haven't seen that particular statistic, but we have seen kind of an erosion in, in many precincts and sort of like the public's understanding and appreciation of both marriage and fatherhood. And there's just kind of this idea out there that, you know, any kind of family form is sort of equally as viable for our kids. And yet what we know in the academy, when we look at kind of the research, the data, the studies, uh, is that in fact, you know, fathers play, again, on average, a pretty critical role in elevating, you know, the, the prospects uh, for both boys and girls um, on educational fronts, you know, emotionally, um, and certainly financially as well. Well, help us understand the scope and the size. What are the numbers are we kind of talking about in terms of fatherless homes? So, you know, around 18 million kids are living today in homes without their fathers. What we see also is that, you know, only about sort of 63% of kids are living in intact married families. So the rest of those kids are living in some other kind of family structure. Um, and almost one in two kids will, across the course of their childhood, spend some time, you know, outside of an intact married family. It's usually in the family headed by, um, you know, by their mother. So. 
the bottom line here, Bob, is that a lot of kids um, are experiencing life without, uh, without father. And I saw one figure where 80% of single parent homes are led by mothers and 41% of children born to unwed mothers uh, last year. 40, I thought we had improved in terms of that statistic, but that's a, uh, um, a still a large percentage itself. Yeah, so it's important though to sort of understand and appreciate that not all of the news when it comes to sort of family life and motherhood is bad news in America today. So we have seen the divorce rate come down since 1980. And what that means practically is that kids who are born today to married parents more likely to be raised by both their mother and their father across the course of their childhood. But we do see, you know, a large minority of kids being born to unmarried parents, as you said, about 41 percent today. Um, although there it's important to know that uh, the majority of those kids are being born to cohabiting parents where mom and dad are still um, in the household together. Of course, the challenge for those cohabiting households is that most of them break up you know, um, within about, you know, five or six or seven years. And so they end up being homes where typically the mom is uh, heading up that household. So uh, this may be um, an odd question in a way, but are there geographic differences? I mean, are there sections of the nation, and that might correlate to poverty, I don't know, but are there geographical differences across the nation where we would have higher instances of fatherless homes? Yeah, so Bob, you and I are in the South, and the South does see, on average, um, more single parent than does the North. Um, so, um, you know, there are differences across the U.S. by, uh, you know, by by poverty, by race, by ethnicity, by religion. And my own work indicates, you know, that that counties, for instance, that have more educated um, parents, um, more Asian American parents. And more religious parents, for instance, are counties where you're going to see more kids being raised by their own married parents. Um, and that's true across across the U.S. I know this is kind of sensitive uh, to say, but uh, you, you mentioned a couple of times that within the minority communities, there is a difference. So there is a racial kind of difference component to this. And I know that's kind of a sensitive thing to inquire, but it, there is quite a distinction, it seems to me, by the statistics. Yeah, of course, one reason the South has more single parent families is that the South has more African American families. And what's I think important to note here, though, is you kind of look at the geography of American family instability. What you see is that there's much more family instability in counties across the U.S. where slavery uh, played a major role in American life, you know, so like, for instance, you know, near the Mississippi Delta. So um, the point here I'm getting at is that one reason we do see racial differences in American family life today is that the legacy of slavery uh, continues to live on in, uh, in our families across the U.S. Um, I know there's also kind of gender differences, I guess. I saw where since 1960, uh, there are more boys living in homes without biological father has doubled to something like 32%. And so it seems like that there are some of those uh, gender differences as well. Um, well, certainly both boys and girls have seen their um, odds of spending time in a fatherless household increase. Um, but there isn't a huge difference in sort of the share of kids um, by gender who are experiencing, you know, life without a father across the course of their childhood. Um, so let's go to some of the, the reasons before we get to some of the effects. Um, and I guess the major cause, uh, primary cause is divorce, I guess. Well, I mean, you know, actually today, you know, what we're seeing is actually unwed childbearing is the sort of major um, gateway, you know, to family instability for, for kids. Um, so mm -hmm. if you and I were having this conversation back in 1978, it would have been divorce. But today in 2022, um, what we're more likely to see is that kids have, um, you know, parents who are having, you know, them outside of wedlock. And um, because, you know, plenty of those kids are being born to single moms and then uh, also a large share are being born to carboning families that are unstable, you know, it's, it's sort of that's the route to which um, kids are more likely to experience uh, family instability and fatherlessness as well today. And um, let's talk about some of the, the, the impact. Uh, what are some of the, the things to be concerned about uh, resulting from fatherless homes? Yeah, so dads matter, you know, a lot when it comes to everything from schooling to crime to incarceration to poverty. So kids are being raised in homes without their 
uh, married fathers about four times more likely to be poor. Um, mm -hmm. We see that kids are being raised, you know, apart from their married fathers are about, you know, twice as likely to end up in prison or in jail by the time they're uh, 30. Um, we see that, you know, for instance, um, uh, they're also about two times more likely to be depressed as adolescents um, as well. So, you know, having um, maybe a married father on scene is just linked to a whole bunch of good outcomes for both boys and girls. What's well, also important to note here too, that kind of the way in which this sort of plays out is it is gendered. So boys are more likely to kind of act out. And that means, you know, it could mean delinquency, it could mean being expelled from school, it could mean being arrested, incarcerated. And girls are more likely to internalize, you know, become anxious mm -hmm. or depressed um, when uh, they're experiencing, you know, family instability on the home front. So uh, again, both boys and girls are affected, but they're often affected in somewhat different ways by, you know, the breakdown of their parents' marriage or by some other kind of family trauma on the home front. You know, one thing that I saw, which I, 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 it was unexpected, and I know that suicide is kind of a one of those uh, 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 growing issues and crises itself among the youth, but uh, they're two times more likely to commit suicide. 63% of teen suicides uh, are related to, um, or at least uh, described from fatherless homes. And I, I don't know, that was unexpected to me and a, and a sad comment there in terms of suicide. Yeah, I mean, there is certainly, I mean, you, you kind of pick the, the, the outcome for kids um, and there's a, you know, there's a strong association between, you know, having your father in the home, um, having him engaged, you know, in a positive way um, and, and, and that outcome. And it could be teenage pregnancy, it could be suicide, um, you know, it could be, um, you know, uh, using, using drugs. All these kinds of outcomes are, are closely linked to what's happening in our homes. Well, and one thing that kept coming up, and, and again, um, reviewing material for our conversation, is the impact really in terms of boys. Um, the lack of the guidance or the role model, what have you, but it seems from what we read on the literature that it has more multi-leveled dimension impact on boys in terms of a fatherless home. We are seeing more evidence sort of in, in the spirit of your comment, Bob, work done by David Altar, for instance, in MIT has kind of underlined the ways in which both kind of in, in our schools and, you know, in the criminal justice system and even in the labor force today, we are kind of seeing um, a particular effect of being raised without fathers um, or a more visible effect of being raised without fathers um, showing up in the data. And what's happening here, of course, is that in general, our boys are floundering more in our schools. In general, um, they're having more difficulties with, uh, with the police. And in general, um, they're less likely to be um, doing well um, in their early 20s when it comes to employment. So um, when they don't have the benefit of the dad, you're, you're especially likely to see those, um, those boys and young men who are not working, having trouble with the law, and um, and you know failing or or getting suspended at, at school. Well, now help us understand um, the difference between biological father and non-biological father. Um, is the correlation still, even though you may have a non-biological father or figure, versus not having uh, your real biological father? What's the difference there as it relates to the impact? So what we see on average is that, you know, kids are most likely to flourish when they're being raised by their own um, married biological parents and they have their, their mother and their father in the household. And having a stepfather or having, you know, a boyfriend from, you know, um, a cohabiting household, for instance, is not linked to um, generally the better outcomes uh, for kids. Um, and one of the issues there is that family instability is also hard for children. You know, having a revolving cast of caretakers um, come through the household can be really tough for kids. So that's why, you know, I think particularly when it comes to boyfriends, um, we see a lot of evidence that, um, you know, having boyfriends come in and out of the household um, is, is problematic for kids, that there's much higher rates of, of child abuse, for instance, in those contexts. Um, and we can't kind of assume that they're acting like father figures um, to kids 
um, when they're moving through the household. You know, it, 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 I, I may be um, asking this in a, uh, in a not a efficient way per se, but you always hear that it is, it's not better to stay in a bad, quote, marriage. And it puts pressure on the father and saying, I don't want us to divorce because of the children. And, and then some kind of say, no, that's not the kind of right rationale. How do you approach and see that, the importance to, okay, for the sake of the children, you should be intact. To what degree is that in importance? That's a great question, Bob. And it's really the case. Uh, we've seen in research from my colleague here at New York, Bob Emery. Um, that kids who are in high conflict homes where like there are plates flying through the kitchen on Saturday night where there are regular screaming fits. You know, it's in those kinds of homes where it looks like it's better for the parents to part ways. The challenge in America today when it comes to divorce is that it looks like the clear majority of divorces involving kids are not high conflict situations. So it could be that one parent is depressed or that one parent has you know, found a new romantic interest at work or you know, some other kind of issue. But if we were kind of prioritizing the welfare of the kids rather than sort of the, you know, the, the desires of the parents at that moment in time, um, you know, the parents would kind of prioritize working things out and staying together for the sake of their children because it's in those lower conflict divorces um, that kids are more going to be suffering emotionally, socially, financially, that you know, parents often have to sell the house, move into separate condos, you know, um, kids kind of lose faith in sort of the possibility of lifelong love when they see their parents divorce for these low conflict reasons. So again, we're seeing um, you know, even in the media, for instance, there's a New York Times article. Um, talking about div divorce as a radical act of self-love written by um, a professor and attorney in San Francisco. And she honestly admitted that her husband had done kind of nothing wrong, um, but she was kind of just looking to turn a new page in her life. And it's precisely those kinds of divorces, though, which are the most, I think, challenging for kids because um, they recognize that at some level that they're unnecessary and um, that, it, you know, it makes things much more difficult for them socially, moving between two houses or apartments, um, you know, emotionally and, of course, financially as well. So it's important, again, to distinguish between high conflict, including physically violent you know, situations and low conflict situations where more sort of individualistic reasons are, you know, kind of rising to the floor. And it's those lower conflict more me-centered divorces that are, I think, especially you know, problematic for our kids. So let's look at short-term and long-term. Short-term, well, what do you do? I mean, if it's a fatherless home, how, how does the community or, or what have you, in other words, uh, what is to be done in a situation that you find yourself in a fatherless home? Yeah, so I mean, I was raised by a single mother. I think my mom did a pretty good job raising my sister and me. Um, and, you know, one of the things that she did was really spend a lot of time with, with my grandparents who were in a long, you know, stable, uh, rich marriage. And so my sister and I had kind of an upfront um, view of, of a great marriage and a great family, um, which I think was valuable for us. And that's so part and parcel of sort of dealing with this is kind of putting your kids in touch with good families, um, with, you know, married moms and dads, so they can kind of see what that looks like, have access to, you know, um, you know, a father kind of figure. Um, we do see two some events from Robert Putnam at Harvard that kids who are engaged in religious communities are more likely to also kind of um, navigate single parenthood successfully as well. So there are some things like that where you can kind of put your kids in touch with communities and um, and father figures who can help, um, you know, them uh, get through all of this. But I think one important point I'd make um, here for both non-residential fathers, and of course there are many, and for, um, you know, and, and for parents more generally, is it's, it's important to try to figure out ways that you can have a long-term relationship with social father, for instance, or father figure. And for divorced dads, it's important to kind of um, appreciate how important it is to be kind of consistent in seeing your kids and to also though, expect a lot of them. Not be kind of like the Disney dad who's just always going to give your kids, you know, a good time. 
um, and said, if you're if you are a divorced father um, and you have your kids, you know, it's your turn for custody. You know, it's important for them to do their homework, you know, do chores, things like that, kind of do tough things with you um, to, um, you know, develop, you know, that sort of full, fully kind of textured relationship with them. You know, um, I saw where the average uh, school age boy only spends 30 minutes per week on a one in one conversation. I was blessed to have uh, both mom and dad. Um, but dad, he had to work two jobs. Um, he never came to a football game. It was grandpa. And in many ways, my love for history and different things, and I love my father, and certainly as I got older, I mean, we, we, you know, it, 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 it's wonderful. But at those certain times, even having a, a loving home and, and, and the, both of them working uh, to support us, it was grandpa who for me was kind of that figure during those tough teenage years when you're already kind of struggling a little bit. So that can also, um, that need can also be in father homes, I guess is what I'm trying to communicate. Yeah, no, I think it's, um, it is the case that in my own research, for instance, indicates that it's not just having the presence of the father that matters your kids, it's you're having a, a good relationship with your dad that matters um, on things like delinquency, teenage pregnancy, and depression. Um, so those are all kind of important points to acknowledge here. Um, but I think actually your experience and, and my experience as well is also, I think, you know, important to know, and that is just that we, we shouldn't also kind of minimize the importance of, um, of Kim. You know, um, and so having you know, grandparents, including grandfathers, you know, um, in on the parenting act can be, um, you know, great for both for them and, and for the grandchildren as well. Um, and so, especially too, I think for single mothers, you know, who are looking for, um, you know, for um, sort of assistance in raising their kids, you know, trying to, to bring the grandfather into the picture can be really helpful as well. Um, uh, some people are going to holler at home as soon as I ask this question. Is there a role of government or legislation that can address this particular issue? Or is this more of a communal, social value kind of dilemma that we're confronted with? Well, I think this is certainly a cultural issue and, and one that we have to sort of address in the academy and Hollywood and, you know, um, in Madison Avenue and elsewhere. But I think the state, you know, the government does have a role here. Okay. What we now see is that a lot of our, uh, our welfare programs or, or means tested programs like Medicaid, for instance, end up penalizing marriage. I talked to a Virginia couple here uh, not too long ago, um, cohabiting um, and two beautiful little daughters, kind of asking them what's going on here. And they said, well, actually, we had sat down at the kitchen table and we're just going to ram the numbers. And we realized that if we um, got married and, you know, uh, presented ourselves for the, the Medicaid program here in Virginia, um, we'd lose access to it because of, um, you know, he was making a modest income as, a, as an IT tech, but still, you know, combined it would have put them out of access to, to health care for the mother and the two uh, daughters. So we should be addressing, I think, these marriage penalties um, at the federal and state levels. And then beyond that, I would say we should be thinking about Kind of how can Virginia at the state level think about educating um, its uh, high school students on the importance of uh, marriage or what's been called the success sequence, which is about a couple of things, including marriage. And then also thinking about how perhaps the federal government could do more in the way of like PSAs to sort of educate our young adults about kind of how much both fatherhood and marriage matter. Because again, when you look at kind of polling that's being done on these issues, the surprising thing is that a lot of people, particularly a lot of younger adults, have no appreciation of all the science that we have about how much uh, both dads matter and how much marriage matters as well. So I think there is a role for the state play in trying to address um, this retreat from marriage that's unfolded in the U.S. You know, really since the late 1960s. Well, we literally only have a minute or so remaining. What's your final thought, final word you would like to share with us? Well, I guess the final thing that I would say is that we, um, we should also understand and appreciate that um, there's a kind of enlightened self-interest, you know, that I think adults should have. And that is that we see that um, adults who are married and adults, both women and men, and adults who are living more family-focused lives today 
are much more likely to report that their lives are meaningful and also happy. I'm not saying that we're always happy, those of us who are married with kids, it can be awfully stressful. But on average, over time, there's no doubt that today in America, American women and men who are married with kids are much more likely to be approaching. And, and folks don't realize that, but they should and, uh, and act accordingly. Well, believe it or not, that is all the time we have. Wow, great uh, interaction and information. I want to thank my guest, Dr. Bradford Wilcox, Director of the National Marriage Project. And I want to thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.